Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. The kingdom defines everything in the Bible. Just write that down. You'll, you'll figure that out in 10 years. It took me a while to figure that out. I've heard people say, Dr. Monroe, how do you make things so simple that, that can be so complicated to others? And how come when you say something, it makes sense to me for the first time? And my answer is because I understand the kingdom. You cannot translate or interpret the Bible outside the kingdom concept. It's impossible. If you don't interpret the Bible through the concept of the kingdom, you will result in error. And I hope our pastors in this room are listening to me carefully, please. All those who in pastoral ministry, if you are involved in any form of leadership in this ministry, in cell groups or whatever, remember what I'm telling you. You cannot understand the Bible in its true context if you take it out of the kingdom context. That goes for everything. And the kingdom is not a religion. The kingdom is a country. When Jesus used the term kingdom, he was talking about a literal place, a country. He called it the kingdom of heaven. Heaven is a real place. It's more real than earth. Heaven produced earth. Bible says the things that are unseen created the things that are seen. Heaven is unseen. It's the invisible world. It's more real. Your body is not as real as your spirit. So the earth is not more real than heaven. Heaven produced it. And so heaven is a kingdom, it's a country. And God used the term because he was trying to communicate all the concepts of kingdom activity so that man could relate to it. The kingdom is a country ruled by a king. It has a government, a real government. In the kingdom of heaven, the government is a person. It's not like your government. Our government is not the cabinet. You may think it is. It's not the prime minister. It's not the president of your country. The government is a very complicated thing in our democracies. The government includes the executive, which is the prime minister's office. It includes the cabinet, which is the appointed group by the prime minister. It is the senate, it's a separate group of people. It is the parliament, which includes the opposition and the government leaders who are members of parliament. It includes the attorney general's office. It includes the Supreme Court justices. It includes the ministries of government, like education and economics, and all that is government. But when you talk about a kingdom, they don't exist. It's a person. The king is the government. So the king doesn't need to consult with any other group to make a decision or create a law. So when you read the Bible, you'll find in many places this statement. Who 
can counsel the Lord. And it's not a suggestion. It's a rhetorical question. Which means no one does God consult concerning his decisions. So a kingdom is a country, it has a government. God used that concept so that you can understand his words. In my first book on the kingdom, which is the most important book for you to read on the kingdom, because in that book I dealt with concepts. And concepts help you understand words. In that book I talk about all the concepts in the kingdom. One of them is petitioning. And I want to talk about that tonight. You cannot petition in a religion. Petition is a legal word from the courts of law. The word petition in Hebrew is the word we translate as prayer. So prayer is not a religious activity. And that's tough for you to accept right now. Because you came out of a religious background that taught you religious activities and therefore prayer is stuck into this religious ritual that you go through. And thus you get no results. And so we have to change our concept. So I want to talk to you about the prayer of Jesus, but I want to focus on it from a different perspective. Write this title down. I want to talk to you about rediscovering the prayer template of Jesus. What is a template? Jesus gave us a template. The template was given to us as a result of a question they asked him. And it was a question that you still ask today. How do we pray? So he gave them a template. Stop telling people this is the Lord's Prayer. It is not the Lord's Prayer. It is a template. They asked him the question, how do we pray? Now, he couldn't give you, you know, a, a prayer for you to repeat for the rest of the life on earth. So he was giving us something we missed. He was giving us a template. The template is the procedure that you should use when you approach the government to make a petition. Write that down. Jesus gave us what? A template that provides the procedure that you use for petitioning a government. So when you study the prayer, the template that he gave us, everything is in it that is necessary for you to approach your government and get answers. Quoting the Lord's so-called prayer does not get you results. Because it was a template. Those of you who, uh, who have computers and laptops in this room and iPads, you know that in your experience with a computer, when you buy a computer, right, it comes with some software on it. Am I correct, Pastor Dave? Yes. And in that software, you'll find different programs that provide templates. The templates there are only used as a guide for you to follow a form or a procedure. They got templates in your computer. Some of you don't even know it's there, but it's there. For example, how to lay out a newsletter. It came free. It's in your computer now. How to lay out memos. And they give you 20 different types of memos. You never use them. They got a template in your computer that shows you how to create a brochure. You ain't got to go to a graphics artist. It's in your computer. 
Just drop in your information. Now this is important. A template is the structure that comes with the product. But the template does not have the substance. You have to put the information that you want in the template. Jesus gives us a prayer template. It is a procedure for you to approach your father God who is the judge and the government and you are the citizen and he tells you put in whatever you need in this template. It's already laid out for you. You ain't got to try and create the structure. I gave you the structure. Are you, are you clear? Yeah. So if you, if you read the Lord's Prayer it's like reading the information in the template. It doesn't apply to you. So, I, you know, at the end of these religious meetings that you all have, they say, and now let us pray the Lord's Prayer. And folks who have cut, come on, talk to me, high on something, you know, all kind of vagabonds, they would start praying it. They know it. Our Father who art in heaven. And they quote this prayer. And God doesn't hear a word. Why? They're using a template that has no meaning. So, it's like asking me, how do I write an executive memo? That was their question. I say, let me show you. So I go to your computer and I click on template. Then I click on executive memo. And four memos come up. I said, now, which one do you want? Which one looks the way that you want it? I want that one. Good. Now, you got to put in your own information. But you got the procedure. Don't send the person you're writing to the template. We keep selling God the template. We keep giving back to God the template. And God says, I don't know what you're talking about. This, you, you send back the structure. I want the substance. And there's a difference. So the disciples asked Jesus a question. Let's read it. Luke chapter 11. One day he was praying in a certain place. And when he was finished praying, one of his disciples came and asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. That was the question. Teach me how to write effectively a memo to an executive. Teach me how to approach a judge in a court and not get thrown out. Teach me how to prepare a case for me to get what I'm rightfully deserving from a court. That was the question. Teach me how to proceed with the procedure to get what I want. Please remember, if you take it out of the context of a kingdom, you will make this a religious act. So they're asking him about a legal procedure. Because remember, they said he is Messiah. Messiah means king. It's not a religious word. It's a politician. But a king is also what? The government. They said, thou art the Christ. The word Christ means anointed king. You don't come to a king as if you're coming to some mushy person who you have to manipulate and con them into doing what you want. A king is a government that has legal proceedings. He has boundaries. You know, people, boy, religion is something else. The Bible in your hand is called what? The New and Old Testament. Write that down. This is not a devotional book. There are lawyers in this room who will tell you that the word testament has nothing to do with religion. They'll tell you. Ask them. In school, they have to study that a testament is a legal document. So the Bible in your hand right now is a legal document. When you go before the court and you have a case and the lawyer wants to prove your case. Who do they bring to the courtroom to help you? 
What's the word? Witness. Okay? What does the witness do? Say it slow. Say it like a Pentecostal. See? Now here you are in a legal courtroom and you're using a religious word you think. You never thought about it, huh? There's no testimony in religion. It's only in a courtroom. Because it has to do with a testament. You are, losing, you are using a legal document to make a case. That's why it's called testament. You are testifying. You are sitting on the witness stand telling God, based on the law, you promised me this. And I qualify as a law-abiding citizen, so I have a right, justice, righteousness, to demand what the legal document promised me. It's called petitioning. God doesn't answer every prayer. Don't believe it. James was very close to Jesus. One of his favorite disciples. Matter of fact, these three were very close to Jesus. Peter, James, and John. James was with Jesus all the time, most of the time. They were tight. You know what, Jesus, you know what James wrote? James says, you ask and you have not. He wrote that. He said, you pray and God don't answer. He, you ask and you have not. And he told us why. He said, because you ask but you miss. He said, I miss. You miss. He says, and you talk plenty and get no results. Because it doesn't matter how much you talk. If the procedure is wrong, the judge shuts down the case. Nothing makes a judge more angry than a lawyer unprepared. Do you know why? Because the lawyer is supposed to know the procedure. So you come before God with all your snares and your snort and your crying and you know <laughs> and God said look I don't understand this. Speak to me in testament. Testify. How am I going to testify? I have to use the testament. You petition with law. Write that down, please. It's hard to teach the kingdom because the kingdom puts law back in its rightful place. And we hate law because we love grace. And somehow we have developed a religion that hates law and lives on grace. Jesus told a story, we read it before in this series, where a widow went to see a judge. Remember that story? If you read that, the judge didn't give her anything because she was a widow. Or because she was poor. The Bible says she came to the judge because she knew her rights. Rights come from law. It doesn't come from grace. What grace does is put you back in the position so you could obey the law. Are you with me? If you break the law in, my, in the Bahamas or in any country you are in and you are found guilty, they can put you in prison, right? Take you out of the society. The judge could decide, you know something? I like you because this is your first, you know, whatever you call it. Offense. offense that's the word. This is your first offense. The judge has prerogative. It's called prerogative. He can say because this is your first offense you ain't getting away you know. The judge says I'm going to take your offense and if anybody asks you 
how you got out, let them come talk to me. In other words, you didn't get away. He took your offense on himself. And he says, I am going to let you go. That's grace. Are you with me? That's forgiveness. That's grace. That's mercy. Well, you run out of the court and you go dance and praise the Lord, I'm free. But just now, before you go, I got one thing to say. And he always says it. Don't come back here. What's he, what's he saying by that? Go out and obey the law again. Not forget the law. So grace is given to keep law, not to destroy law. I quote Jesus, I did not come to destroy the law or the prophets that spoke them, but I came to actually enforce it, he says. And if any man breaks one of these laws, he's considered least in my kingdom, country. He was a country. But if any man teaches and keeps these laws, he's considered what? Great in my country. Lawless people God can't deal with. You are useless to God. And, but we love grace because it allows us to break law. That's how you sin. I know you sin. You know just how you sin. I got you figured out. You sin like I used to sin. I used to plan to sin tomorrow. And I would plan what I can do afterwards. I can go and ask God to forgive me. So I'm using grace to plan my sin. The Apostle Paul says, do not use grace as a license to break the law. This is a legal transaction. So the disciples are asking Jesus a question. Teach us how to what? Pray. Take the word pray out because you're still religious. I can see it in your eyes. Put the word petition. Go. Teach us how to petition. Let's put another word in there. Teach us how to have the procedure correct to get what we petitioned from the government. That was the question. They said, because according to us, John is getting results. And we ain't getting none. Let's see what he does. What does he answer? The fact that he asks, they were asking him to teach them is a result of some important things. One, it means that prayer is not automatic. It must be taught. It must be learned. It is a legal procedure. And lawyers are retained to prepare us to follow the procedure. And therefore, that's why he gave you your own lawyer. Who is your lawyer? He told you. He said, you don't understand this, uh, this constitution. He said, so I made provisions for you. I gave you a personal legal advisor. He actually calls him the counselor. There are lawyers in this room. Ask them what they call them. They are called counselors. The exact word Jesus used is the word parakletos in Hebrew. Parakletos is a legal word for a lawyer. As a matter of fact, let me blow your mind. The Pharisees and scribes were completely different from each other. The Pharisees were religious leaders. The scribes were lawyers. So when Jesus spoke to them, he was speaking to both religious people and legal minds. And he called them both hypocrites. Why? They were using the law to oppress the people. Are you following me? Okay. So, Jesus knows that you need a lawyer because this stuff can be very complicated. And so he said these words, read my lips. Now you'll understand his words. He said, I will give you a comforter and he will abide with you. Even the Holy Spirit, the counselor, watch him now. And he will guide you into all truth. And he will teach you and show you the things I tried to show you. In other words, when it gets complicated, the lawyer begins to interpret the complicated parts for you. That's why you have the Holy Spirit. So that you can make proper petition. 
sometimes the request is so deep he said you need to shut your mouth and let the counselor talk himself we call it tongues speaking in tongues is when the counselor says let me handle this for you the apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8 he says there are times when we don't know what to petition for come on remember that verse he said because we are weak in our preparation we can't decide what to pray in other words you might be wondering let's say if a country has a referendum and you don't know how to how to choose or what to do the Bible says pray in the spirit because you, you would be so confused you don't know what's, what's right or wrong yes or no God says I want you to leave that alone and let the lawyer take over and pray in the spirit it says because the Holy Spirit knows the mind of God and he knows the will of God and he helpeth us in our infirmity and he prays for us it says in utterances that cannot be understood that means he's praying in the spirit language I think all of us in the room would agree that when lawyers start talking we don't know what they're talking about you know their language can be very confusing and the same thing with doctors when doctors start talking about your own body you gotta say interpret that for me please because they use words and concepts that are so different that you have to be trained to understand them the Holy Spirit knows how to pray better than anybody because he was assigned to you by the government can I use the term the Holy Spirit is your heavenly prosecutor the good thing about our government is it gave you a prosecutor who never leaves you you have him all the time you can consult him he will guide you teach us to pray means teach us the procedure that makes us successful in our appeal in our petition is anybody okay with me right now do you understand what I'm saying please what I'm teaching you is the most important thing you know about prayer and you never heard it because people keep putting the prayer in a religion when in fact it is in a country you don't approach God as a religious person you approach him as a legal powerful king that's why he gave you a book of law the Bible is called the laws of God not the suggestions of God not the emotions of God the law of God all right so Jesus begins to answer them and he gives them what I call a pattern the prototype let's go through it very quickly you gotta write fast this is gonna be good but you gotta listen fast all right first he begins now we know prayer is what petition so petition is a legal appeal or a demand on a government based on constitutional rights protected by law the Constitution is the Bible the law are the principles by which you use to demand things that he promised you and your rights have to do with your being under the constitutional laws of God you got to be born again of the Spirit so there's some qualifications here for you to pray petition also is the demands of citizens based on guaranteed rights no one who's an, an illegal citizen in this country could demand anything from the government so if you're not born again of the Holy Spirit and full of the Holy Spirit, receive him as your Lord and Savior and your King, you cannot pray to God. The first prayer God would hear from a human who is not a citizen is, I repent, forgive me, I receive the kingdom of God, I receive the Holy Spirit. God will hear that prayer. It's like submitting to the requirements of citizenship. Let me quote Jesus. If any man would believe in his heart, and confess with his mouth he shall be saved that's the citizenship qualification if you ain't never done that forget praying it's going right to the roof punks and back down because you're not a citizen you cannot demand from a government that you don't relate to illegal citizens have no rights so petition requires citizenship petition is also simply reminding the government of what is constitutionally promised to you 
every city citizen's constitution in every country is simply a legal promise. If you read our constitution, that's what it is. Just a list of promises. We promise you that if you are a citizen, you have these rights. The Bible is a book of promises. But they are legal promises. And you must be a citizen to qualify so you can make demands. And when you demand them, it is called petitioning. Petitioning is what you call prayer. It's not a religious act. It is a legal transaction. So when we go to pray to God in a few minutes, you can't come to God with mushy feelings and all this stuff and just blabber in your mouth. You got to come with hard evidence. Hallelujah. That's why you need to read the Bible. The reason why you don't read the Bible is because you don't know what the Bible is. The Bible is material for petitioning. You cannot demand from God what he never promised you or you cannot demand from God what you don't remember he promised you. Or you cannot demand from God what you don't even know he promised you. Am I making sense? So you better go home and pick that Bible up and make this, this year the year of the Constitution. And read the whole book. There are promises in Zephaniah that you, you cannot know because you know where the book of Zephaniah is. It's right before Haggai which is right next to Zechariah, which is right before Malachi. If you don't know where the, the sections of the Constitution is, you can't find the promises, how are you going to pray? And you start praying all this funny prayer, God says, I, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm looking for evidence. Evidence is based on the constitutional promise. God says, I watch over my word to perform it. I don't watch over your blabbering. So if you don't give me my word back, I can't perform it. Clear? So when we pray, we're supposed to pray with precision, with confidence, knowing First uh, John says, chapter 5, he says, if we pray according to the will of God, watch this, we know that he hears us. He didn't say if you pray by spitting on the ground, rolling over, staying up all night, hawking, spitting, snort on your nose, crying, weeping, screaming, he'll hear you. No, he doesn't. It says if you pray according to what he intended for you to have in the first place, that's what will means, then you know that he what? Hears you. Now, the next verse, if he hears you, you also know that you have what you ask. Because if he told you to say it because he wrote it, then he says he'll perform what he wrote. So you can walk away saying, I got it. Prayer should not be, you know, a, a hit and miss hope. It should be a precision. That widow went to that courtroom. Ah, she didn't care what kind of judge that was. And the Bible described the judge. Jesus said the judge hated people and God. You can't find no one worse than that. <laughs> the guy hated God and people. The Bible said, Jesus said, he chose the worst description. He said, and the little widow, the worst level of society walked in there. And she says, I come for my rights. I don't care who you are or how you feel about me. And the Bible says, she wore him out. And he says, give her what she comes for, at least she kill me. <laughs> a little widow brought down a massive judge, not because of screaming. Loud prayer doesn't impress God. No, you're going to forgive me, you know, but I was brought up in being town. I've seen some prayer meetings. I've been in some of them, in them, in them little wooden church, man. We, yeah, oh, Lord. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. I'm sitting there going, this is interesting. I've been in those meetings. One time they prayed for me, I would break my neck. Bless him, Lord. Fix him. Come on. Boy, speak. Say something, boy. And I'm like, oh, God, woman, you're killing me. So I just say something so she could stop. They call them prayer meetings. And things never changed, did they? Never changed. Because it's not what you do, it's how you do it. All right. So Jesus begins to teach them. He says, first of all, here's the template. Our Father, who is where? In heaven, 
hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, each one of those statements is a separate act. It's a step, separate concept. Our Father, that's a concept. Who is in heaven, that's a concept. That's a template. Hallowed be your name, that's a concept. Thy kingdom, that's a concept. Come on earth, that's a concept. As it is in heaven, that's a separate concept. Give us today, that's a concept. He didn't say give us a month. God don't give monthly things. <laughs> he guides you day by day. See, if you miss the concept, you pray wrong. Give us today, what? Daily bread, that's a concept. And forgive us, that's a separate concept. That means we got problems. As we forgive those, that's a separate concept. Something you got to do. That trespass, that's a different concept. Against us, not God. When someone trespass against you, it didn't say you must demand them to forgive you. You missed the concept. He said, no matter what happened, you must forgive them or your petition shuts down. Read it carefully. It's a careful prayer. It's a template. Lead us not into temptation. That's a concept. Deliver us from evil. Matter of fact, the word is the evil one, specifically in Hebrew. For the kingdom is yours. It's an interesting template. All right. I want to quickly go through the template, and you've got to read this with me fast and write fast, okay? The first one is our Father. He begins with the most important thing, our. He said, when you come to the court, you don't just come representing yourself. So when you want to petition your government, you are representing all the citizens. So you come on behalf of not just yourself, but the community of the faith. Our means unselfish. Then he says, Father. Father is a concept. It's not a name. It's a function. The word Father means Abba. Hebrew, Pater, Greek. It means the source, the sustainer, the supplier. That's what the word means. The word Father means source and sustainer. That, is, that, that alone is enough to just, you know, shout on. He said, when you come to petition, the person you are petitioning is the source of everything you need. Abba means source. It means supplier. In other words, you must first identify God, Jehovah, as your source of life, substance, sustenance, and owner of everything. Now, this is important. When you approach your government, you must acknowledge that government owns everything. So you ain't asking someone who can't answer. Hmm. Our community, father, source. Now why is this important? Because of the next statement. Where's your source? He takes your source from earth and places it where it belongs. Your source, he says, is not on earth. Your source is in heaven. Our source is our Father who owns everything. Our supply is not limited to earth, is what he's saying. If what you ask for that I promise you is not on earth, I'll make it for you. Lord have mercy. I'll create things because I own the seen and the unseen. Your Father, your source, Stop, stop thinking that way. See, every time I say father, you think of a person. That's religious thinking. Your father, your source is not on earth. 
So when you approach prayer, petitioning, you must get this complete idea that I am talking to someone who owns it all. So I don't trust no one else around me. That's why I come into you, God. I'm coming to you because ain't nobody could help me. And you got what? Everything. You own everything. So prayer is with confidence. No matter how big the request is, once you find it in the doctrine, in the document, in the, in the testament, you can ask for it. You know what God said? And we can pray that tonight in a minute. God says, ask me for the nations and I will give them to you. That is in the Bible. Oh. You could come before God and say, God, give me the Bahamas. Give us back the Bahamas you want. God said, I heard your prayer. That's a good petition. And then you quote the verse. Thus it says in Article 5, subsection Psalm, Article 45, ask me for the nation. See, you told me that. I want that. You can ask for Haiti. You can ask for Jamaica. It's in the document. And the Bible says the nations are the Lord's. Can I quote it? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world, as the nations, and they, the people that dwell in them. They belong to him. The word Lord means owner. You can actually ask God for a country. He promised it. And he's big enough to deliver it because why? He is Abba. What is Abba? Source, owner. So right away your prayer changes. You're not begging anyone who can deliver our Father who's in heaven. Holy is your name. Very important word. Holy means pure, but most importantly, it means different. You know, sometimes people walk around and they wear long dresses and long face and long gloves and long, you know, teeth and long everything and they think they're holy. Holiness is not a dress. It's a disposition. Holiness has more to do with you being distinct from other people because of your standard. So Christ is saying when you come before God, here's the template. You're talking to someone who ain't like nobody you know. <laughs> Holy means peculiar. Peculiar means you are different from every other God, if I can use that term, and every other human. So I can't put you in nobody's class. He said, when you come before this judge, there ain't no judge like him. Don't compare him to nobody. He is different, distinctive. I'm so glad he's not like you. Because one day you up, next day you down, and I might come to you on a down day. He is perfect. Holy is what? Your name. Write the word name down. Name is not a tag. Name in Hebrew means being. B-E-I-N-G. Being. Name means the character of a thing. It means the very essence, the quality of it. This is why when you read the Bible, you find that God is high on names. Because in the Hebrew context, you see, in this Bahamian context, you don't make no sense. In a Hebrew mind, the Bible is a Hebrew book. In Hebrew, the word name is the thing. It's not a label. So when you say to him, holy is your name, you're saying holy is your very being. That means you are totally, completely, transparently perfect. There's nothing in you that is unrighteous. Your character is pure. You have no ulterior motives. You cannot lie. Because to lie, you got to be able to hide something. You can't even hide. You're so pure. Name. Holy is your entire character. 
Different is your essence. Name. By the way, uh, maybe we'll talk about this you know, some other time. We talk about prayer. But when you talk about praying in the name of Jesus, you even ain't got to use the word, you know. It ain't talking about using the word. My son, I assigned him to, to take over all of my business, all my private investments and everything else. And I took him to all my bankers, introduced him. I took him to my lawyer, introduced him. I took him to my agent, my insurance agents, introduced him. And every time I met with them, I said, now, he is now doing business in my name. He never have to use my name. So Jesus said, when you go to the Father, what's the Father? What's the word? Source. He says, ask anything in my name. He's transferring to you the legal authority to do business in his character. Even he got to use the name. So if you are not under his character, you cannot ask anything from God. Are you getting this? So don't tie this five letter word onto the back of your prayer. I've heard some of the dumbest things lately. Dumb things. I've heard people say, and some folks in the Bahamas getting kind of caught up in this thing about names. You know, say, well, you know, uh, the names of Jesus, you know, you should say Yahweh. You should say Elohim. You should say Yeshua. Oh, shut up. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, of who's teaching them this stuff? It's not in the word. It's the character. Whether you use Yahweh or Yeshua or Jesus, it doesn't matter. If you ain't in the character, you ain't gonna get nothing. Let me give you an example. I want you to tomorrow to go to my bank, Fidelity, one of my banks. I want you to go in there. I'm telling you, go in there. I'm telling you, I'm sending you. Go in there. And tell them you come in my name and you want money from my account. What happens? They say, who are you? And that's what, see, even though you may use the name, if you ain't got the rights. So it's not the, 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 the Monroe, the letters Monroe. It's something different I gave my son. It's called, write this down, power of attorney. I gave him legal power to use my character. So the bank might not like him, but they like me. That's why he says, don't use your name. He says, come in my name to the father. Because the father may have problems with your problems. You know, you got issues. But if you come in their character, the essence of Jesus, he says, if my son sent you, you get it. That's why the blood of Jesus is so important. The blood is the attorney power to do business in the name of your king. Am I coming clear? I want you to be smart prayer warriors so you don't waste your time praying 10 hours and ain't get nothing. You could pray in 10 minutes, you know, and get something. If you pray right. So name means the character. God's character and being is like no other. That's what it means, holy. Thy kingdom come means when you approach God, your template says, pray for his country to come. This is important, you know. Most of the time we go for God to pray and we got this long list. You know, rice, flour, beans, let me give God this long list. Clothing for the children, shoes for Mary, you know, rent payment. That's your problem. You don't pray for things in the kingdom of God. Oh boy. Everything you need is in the country. So just get the country. That's what he's saying. Pray for the whole country to come. Stop asking for things. It's like, it's like you asking me for a, a mango, and I say, 
Would you like the tree? If you get the, the mango, you can keep coming back. But if I give you the tree, you got the sauce with you. He said, I'm going to give you the whole country. Don't pray for things. Matter of fact, this is why our president answered. You remember Jesus said in, in Matthew 6, verse 24, he says, why do you pray what you will worry about, what you will eat, what you will drink, what you will wear, how you will live? He says, only pagans pray for those things. You've been a pagan a long time and calling it a Christian. And most Christians probably are pagans. What is a pagan? Anyone who prays for food, clothing, water, drink. You know, Jesus said, if you pray for the things, you are a pagan. That's what Jesus said, not me. You don't pray for the things, you pray for the whole culture to come. Because everything you need is in the culture. Sometimes I wish I could teach. My words are so weak. I went to Boca Raton, invited by a very wealthy Jew. His home was about $3 million. <laughs> I was picked up in a Porsche, and that was his sports car. We drove in to his neighborhood. Hey, hey. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Every house. Oh, Boca Raton. Boca means big, Raton means rat. This is where the big rats live. Pulled up in the garage. There was five garage doors. And I was just in a Porsche. Right away I knew I'm in a whole new world here. Yes. He drove in. The door went up by itself. And we drove in. The door came down by itself. He says, welcome home. My wife cooked for you. I stepped out of the car. Looked around. And I saw three motorbikes, all Harley Davidson's. Brand new. No one used them yet. And I looked over the line, I saw a Rolls Royce, a Bentley, and two Mercedes. I said, okay. Uh, hmm. <laughs> we, went, we went into the side door from the garage, not the front door. And the kitchen was as big as my house. I said, okay. There's a lot of food must be in this kitchen. I saw five refrigerators. I'm thinking, what's going on here? So you can't even imagine. Look at your head. Five. <laughs> I just tried to get one. In the living room, it was like my backyard. They had a TV, big as that screen. And they had seats in the front of it like a movie theater. It's a living room where you watch TV. It's like a movie theater, like, you know, 15 chairs in a row. This is, this is serious business here. The dining room was sunken. And the table seat, 26 people. I looked down like this. I was in another world. And that man never talked about money. My point is this. There's a culture in the neighborhood. Pray for the culture. And you ain't got to worry about things. And I walked in there. His wife ran out. Nice lady. She read all my books. They love Jesus. And they showed me a shelf with all of my VHS teachings. About 30 of them. They said, we ordered these. You are our favorite teacher. And we showed on the screen. He even turned it on. Everything was remote. He just waved. The thing came on. And he waved. And there my, there's my picture on this big screen in this house. I look so handsome. <laughs> the culture was different. No one talks about wealth in that neighborhood. He says, pray for the country to come. My kingdom what? Come. He said the template is don't 
asked to go to it. You pray for it to come to you on earth. And come means it is possible. You got to get that man. But you know, we ain't going to really have a good rate until we get to heaven. That's not what Jesus said. Well, the kingdom can't come until, you know, Jesus come again. That's not what he said. Read the template. Jesus Christ would not ask you to do something that is not possible. If he asked you to demand something not possible, he's a liar. So if he said, let it come, it means it can come. We ignore his prayer, his template. You can have kingdom experience now. I'm living it, I'm telling you, I'm feeling it all in my life. And the more I learn it, the more it takes over your life. That's why I keep teaching it to you. you gotta, it's like you got to be cleansed from religion to experience the kingdom. It can happen now. Next word, your will be done. What does this mean? Your will means your purpose, your intent. The word will means intention. A constitution is actually the constituted intention of the people's desires for themselves. So in a kingdom, the constitution is the king's intended desires for the citizen. Are you clear? So the constitution is the will of the people. Jesus said, when you approach your country, your government, pray for the government's will, intention, to happen on earth. What God intended. In other words, what was God's original purpose for creating earth? Let that come. What is his purpose for his people on earth? Let that come. In other words, you pray for that to happen on earth. It's possible. So he said, ask for it. In other words, will being done means that everything on earth comply and submit and function as he created them to function. He wants heaven to show up on earth, not in the next millennium, now. I know some of you think I'm crazy. It's okay. People think, you know, boy, you far-fetched, you know, you... You actually believe the kingdom of God can manifest in your country in its laws and values and culture? The answer is yes, I believe that. Otherwise, this is going to be a mess to live in for the rest of my life. This can't be the way I go out. Not the way things are now. I don't know about you, but I can't live like this for the rest of my life. The garbage that's going on in our culture we got to ask for another culture. And he said it's possible. Number six, on earth. On earth means the physical planet. He says, I want my kingdom to literally affect the physical earth, the natural creation. I've heard people say things like this. They say, well... Uh, you know, uh, the kingdom of God is a spiritual thing, you know, and you can't really, you can't get it mixed up in politics, that's natural. You can't mix it in education, that's not too natural. You can't get it mixed up in the economics. Jesus lied. He did not say that kingdom come on heaven. Heaven is supernatural. Heaven is spiritual. He said, no, I want it on earth. The word earth in Greek is the word tierra. It means the physical dirt. The actual planet. I want to see heaven touch that. Comprende? The people walking around. I'm just trying to tell you, Pastor Mark, what you're teaching is true, but it's a spiritual thing. Man, let me think about this now. Okay, so that means I got to put up with all this junk because what I am killing my life for can't happen where I live. This is a waste of time. You can live to be 80, and you can catch hell for 80 years because what you believe doesn't relate to where you live for 80 years. This is the dumbest theology in the world. Oh. Anybody with me, I feel lonely. Do you understand what I'm saying? Th that's why I stopped being a Christian. Because mm -hmm. it didn't make no sense. 
Look at your face. Look at your religious people. Christians are interesting. I remember I was born in one of them houses. I grew with a Baptist pastor, man. We used to say things like, my Lord owns the cows on a thousand hills. We couldn't eat steak. We couldn't afford it. My Lord owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. We couldn't buy milk. So there's a contradiction. If my father owns the cow, where's the steak? Now, if you tell me he owns spiritual cows, invisible cows, maybe I can get along and say, okay, then I can eat corned beef, or maybe I can eat some sardines. But don't tell me he owns the cows on a thousand hills here, and I can't get milk. Am I making sense? Some of y'all sitting there, you know what I'm talking about, right? You've been through church, man. This stuff don't work. This don't make no sense. And I got to spend 80 years talking about something I can't experience. That's why you're frustrated. And trying to learn this kingdom thing. It's fighting with all that religion, man. It's, it's so tough. So he said, I want my kingdom to come on earth. Earth is the planet. Now, how do you change things on earth? You change it by the world you create. Oh boy, I get too deep here. Okay. Do you know that no country, no, no, yeah. Oh boy, I gotta try to explain this to you. Look at me, please. This is very deep. No country on earth is evil. It is the nation that is evil. Let me explain. The country is the land. The nation is the systems that control the land. We call it the world. The earth is the land. The world is the system. In order to affect the earth, you got to control the world. Is that clear? Are you sure? So when he says, pray, thy kingdom come on earth, he's telling you, take over the world. Let my kingdom system hit the world system, and then the earth will be covered with heaven. You cannot have a righteous country if you don't have righteous laws. If you have a corrupt government, that's the system, you have a corrupt country, that's the result. Let me quote a verse. The earth is the Lord's. What is that? The physical planet. The worlds and they, the systems also, he says, are supposed to be his. That's his will. Christians are amazing people. That's why I don't, you know, I don't, I don't mix with them no more. Christians say things like this. Uh, righteousness exalts a nation. And sin is reproach. Okay, that sounds good. And that's in the Bible. How does righteousness exalt a nation. First, you need to have righteousness in the nation. But we teach the people, stay away from politics, stay away from money, stay away from being powerful, stay away from having a lot of money, stay just be poor and holy. It's this contradiction. You cannot preserve the earth until you influence the world. And you'll be learning that for the next nine months from me. I'm going to teach you that nothing happens on earth until the world changes. What is the world? The governing powers. He says, pray for that. Pray for that. The kingdom is the world. The earth is the territory. It's that simple. So he wants the kingdom to come to earth. The kingdom is what? The governing system of heaven. He wanted to come to earth. We're not talking about religious government. We're not talking about, you know, killing people and like, like, like the Muslims, you know, taking over. You know, that's not what we're talking about. We ain't talking about no Bahamas Spring. Oh, y'all are so slow. You, you don't know about that? 
Oh my God. You ever heard of the Arab Spring? Where the people are taking over the government? That's not what God's talking about. He's talking about, he says, he says it's supposed to happen like yeast. You go everywhere, all of a sudden, they didn't realize you all over the place. And you're affecting law and legislation and values and morals and standards. And they don't know how what's happening. He says, this thing all through the dough. And now the dough is full of yeast and the country becomes righteous. He said, pray for that. Number seven, like it is in heaven. It's a template. He's saying, pray that the same government in heaven will be on earth. Pray for the same authority system, the same values, the same morals, the same standards of heaven will come to earth. The same culture, the same lifestyle, just like it is in heaven. He said, pray for it to come to earth. Petition me. Let me ask you a question. If God says petition him for the culture of heaven to come to earth, then is that possible? Yes. Yeah. So heaven ain't got no crime, no rape, no incest, no abuse, no fornication, no adultery, no homosexuality, no lesbianism, no cussing, no lying, no stealing, no, no shooting. He says, now, nah, okay. He says, now nah, pray for that whole culture of heaven to come to your country. And here we are in our country dealing with referendum for gambling. I have no idea what you're going to do, but listen to this message. Your question should be, is gambling in heaven? I, I can't answer that for you, you know. But, the, you know, the, the, the testimony I read on, on heaven, ain't no gambling there. So we even got to discuss this. If you vote for something that's not in heaven to come to earth, then you are voting against God. How's that for a decision you got to make? The issue is not about how big the groups are, what kind of shirts they wear. Even the religious people don't come in this. You want to know, is it in heaven? That's the standard. You can't pray for God to bring heaven to earth when you're messing up earth with your vote. It don't make no sense. That's why it's impossible to pray this prayer, petition this prayer, and then sin. Because you are canceling your own prayer. There's no adultery in heaven. So how could you pray and then be committing adultery? You've canceled the prayer. Are you getting the template? Yeah. Okay, look at number eight. Give us today our daily bread. You know what that means? Give me suppliers. Us means not just me. <laughs> Boy, do, do we pray selfishly? Oh God. I got this light bill. Don't know where it's coming from, Lord. You're a great God. Mm -hmm. You're powerful, Lord. Here's the light. I meet the need of my light bill. What about the others? He said the template is always bring the community with you. Pay everybody's light bill, Lord. Supply for everybody what they need. Provide tuition for everybody. Children. We just pray for our kids. I need gas in my car. What about the other car sitting behind you? So, Lord, let the heaven of heavens come to earth in our gas tank. <laughs> our. Give us. Look at the next word. Today. God says, I don't want you to ask a bunch of stuff. I want daily supply. Petition the government of heaven for daily supply. Daily supply. Now this really blessed me when I understood it. The, the, the Hebrew word for day here has to do with measure. For example, on Monday you might need $5,000 and on Tuesday 
pay me just twenty dollars what he's saying is it doesn't matter some days you need more than others so it doesn't matter what you need as long as it's you need it that day he's going to supply that am I coming through yes. but this is the part I like bread he's not referring to the loaf in your kitchen the Hebrew concept of bread means everything necessary for life. That's why they call it the bread of life. Bread is not a, a flour and water baked thing in the Hebrew language. Bread means everything I need to live. He says, demand that from the government. And that might mean friendships, good relationships, networks, health, a sound mind, whatever you need for life. He says, demand that from me. Because in me, you live and move. Are you with me now? So he ain't talking about the loaf. Stop praying for food, he says. Pray for everything necessary for you to have a, a good citizen life. You know, that includes getting married. Hmm? You might be praying for a spouse. God says, you don't, you don't, you don't need that for life right now. That mess up your life, you get that right now. So, so you, you, you got to pray safely. Give me what I need for my life. Because right now you don't need a spouse. That could come in three years. Right now you need some help. I got to prepare you for that. So he answers the prayer because the prayer is so proper. Are you with me? Bread means everything. It's a big word in Hebrew that I need for life and godliness. Number nine, forgive us our trespasses. This is a heavy one. Forgive us means to release people. Forgive means to release. This is important. Forgiveness implies that you are carrying someone you need to release. There's some people who hurt you and you carrying them. It's a weight. I can never forget what he did to me. I can never forget what she did to me. And I, and oh, my dead body, I'll forgive that one. You know, if you, if you only knew what they did. And you're carrying this thing, and the person don't even know you carried it. They're having a good time, you know, going all over the world, getting on cruise, and you home got this bitterness. Forgiveness is where you cut the rope. You let them go. He says, when you come before the government, Make sure you ain't dragging nobody. That you ain't got nothing tying up no one in your life. You come with a clean hand, a pure heart. Forgive what? Our trespasses. Not just yours. Ask them to forgive our whole corporate sin. As a community of faith. As a country. We pray for the sins of our own country. You take them on yourself. You know, I was on radio today talking to the, the people and, and I was telling them, I said, and some people miss me sometimes because, you know, for me to tell something, I can explain it. That's why I seem to teach long. I can explain it. Let me tell you what I mean. When, when I told them, I said, okay, we are to blame for this situation in the Bahamas right now. All of us. Did you know that? But I have to explain that. All of us sinned. Me too. Do you know why? We didn't agitate for it to be legal, illegal a long time ago. When it was small. So you can't blame the government. You can actually tell the government, wait a minute, the law says we demand that you carry it out. We didn't. So they didn't do it, we didn't do it, and we got a tumor. So what do we do? Ask for corporate forgiveness. Father, forgive us for allowing this to happen. That's how you pray for your country tonight. Forgive all of us. This ain't no PLP, FNM, or DNA. This is me. I did not demand righteousness. Forgive us our trespasses. That's how Daniel got his prayer answered. You know, Daniel brought his nation's sins on him. You ever read the prayer of Daniel? It's a powerful prayer. Daniel says, we have sinned against you. My Daniel was living clean, you know, fasting and praying. He said, but I don't care how clean I am. I am a part of them. And God saved that nation. Our sins. Now this word, take a deep breath and write this down quick. 
trespass. Why does the Bible use the word trespass? All of us know that when someone trespasses, what are they doing in your property? Are you only answering me? If someone is trespassing, what are they doing? They are wandering into your territory. That's the exact word used in Hebrew. Now, most of us think that trespass is just like sin. But trespass means you are wandering out of your lane. Trespass means you are straying away from God's purpose for your life and getting into other people's business. Trying to be something you are not. Trying to be someone you ain't born to be. Taking other people's positions. He says, repent of that. Get back in lane. Trespass means you are out of God's will for your life. Forgive me for leaving your assignment and meddling with other people. That's what caused the offense. We offend people because we own their property. Their life is their property. How can you wander on my life and try to take over my life? You know the Bible calls that witchcraft. Witchcraft is any attempt to control another human spirit. And witchcraft is everywhere. It's in the pulpit. It's in marriages. It's in companies. It's in governments. It's everywhere. Any attempt to manipulate people is witchcraft. That's in the Bible. So don't think about the witchcraft, you know, is a juju poison. There are people who witch, which is in this room. Witchcraft in this room. If you, if you use your influence to hurt someone, you are a witch. Because you are manipulating their spirit. It's witchcraft. You're trespassing. God says, ask forgiveness. Trespass. Trespass means moving into other people's positions. Some folks can't sing and they're in the choir. They're trespassing. <laughs> you know, it's messing up the whole choir. An old choir trying to sing, and this person will join the choir, sing, and the whole choir is what? Affected. That's trespassing. <laughs> you need to bow and say, excuse me, y'all, I, I made a mistake. This ain't my anointing. Let me go back and be an usher. <laughs> you, know, you, you stay, stay in your lane. You, you, could, you could upset the whole area if you trespass. You trespass. Some people think they could do what I'm doing. This is my territory. You, you don't try this. You disturb people if you ain't supposed to be doing something. You disturb people, not help them. What is sin? Violating the known will of God. Again, that's trespassing. God's will is for you to do certain things. You try to do something else. That's sin. Sin is the word rebellion. You're rebelling against your own position. You're rebelling against what God told you to do, where he told you to be, what he told you to say. That's sin. It's rebellion against the will of God. All right. Okay, let me close with this number 10. As we forgive those who what? Trespass against us. What he's saying is we've got to release people from invading our domain, first of all. And then we must also release them from conflict of purposes colliding. Release them. Forgive those who wander into your lane and confuse your life. He says, this is a template. You pray this to your government. And it's because you need to be pure when you come to your government. You know, uh, there's a man named Willie Nelson. He's a famous guitarist and singer. You all know Willie Nelson? Willie Nelson made a lot of money making music. But Willie Nelson wasn't paying taxes. And he had millions of dollars in the bank from his music. And the IRS finally figured out this man didn't pay a lot of money for taxes. You know what they did for him? He was on this big tour, you know, with all these people coming to these big stadiums. They didn't care. They went, picked him up. <laughs> they took him on his guitar and cowboy hat. Do you all remember that story? They took the fella to the court. 
He stood before the judge. And he told the judge, I am Willie Nelson. The judge says, so what? Watch this now. He says, so what? You didn't pay taxes. Yeah, but now, your honor, do you know who I am? You know who I am? The judge says, listen to me. You break the law. Your fame is canceled in the face of law. And the judge says, <laughs> you're going to go to jail. Take your guitar with you. <laughs> or pay your taxes. That man had to pay millions of dollars in bad taxes. Trespassing. Here's the point I was making. He was trying to make a demand, but he was unqualified. You come to God demanding things, and God says, you know something? Uh, you, you got offense. I can't do business with you. You break the law. Let me deal with you grace people. Jesus said, when you come before the Lord to ask for anything, read my lips. He said, while you are standing there, if the Holy Spirit reminds you that someone has ought against you, do not offer your prayer, it says. Jesus is talking. Go and find a person, he says. Make it right first. Wait a minute. But I thought grace was enough to handle this. You know, but the blood of Jesus is coming. The blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. He said, no, no, no. He says, go and find them. Because you broke a law. Grace. There's no excuse for breaking the law. Hmm. Lead us not into temptation. That means help us to follow your spirit and discernment so we don't wander off into areas we shouldn't go. Submit to the protection of God's authority and you won't wander off. Temptation has to do with testing for weakness. It's the boundaries God put in our lives. He says, stop testing the boundaries. Let me see how far I could go without having sex. God says, wait a minute, you are being led into temptation. I'm gonna take her out, but I ain't gonna do nothing. Let's go by the beach and let's watch the moon set. You know what I mean? This is like, it is, it, <laughs> lead us not where? into areas that test the boundaries. Why? He's trying to keep you qualified to make a petition. He ain't trying to rob you from having a good time. He's trying to protect your procedure in the court. Live right so you can be heard. Say it. Yeah, you, you live right. He'll hear you. The word tempt means to test for weakness. When you wander off into areas, Satan is waiting for you. And he can keep poking until he finds a weak spot. That's what tempt means. It means to test for weak areas. And when he finds it, he grabs it. Choke your life out of you. And all of a sudden you find yourself wandering off into a world you never thought you'd go back to. Stay away from the boundaries. Don't spend your energy trying to avoid sin. Spend your energy trying to do righteousness. It's a different mindset, see? He that seek after what? Righteousness. You don't seek staying away from sin. You seek how to stay right with God. He said, you shall be filled. Deliver us from what? The evil one. That means keep us from the path of the influence of the adversary. Evil one means the one who will distract us from God's purpose and will for our lives. And the devil is the number one assignee. Do you know what Jesus called the devil? That old tempter. He's waiting to test you for weakness. That's why we have to stay away from him. He is dangerous because he's waiting to do his job. He's the tester. The Bible says God tempts no man. But a man is tempted when he moves away out of his own lusts, strays away. 
testing the boundaries. It's kingdom people don't try to get away with nothing. They try to do everything that's right. And then your prayers are answered. For yours is the kingdom. That means that we are not to have our own kingdoms. It's not our country. Our government and our authority and our values and our morals and our world and our lifestyle belong to him. We ain't supposed to have our own lifestyle and then try to get stuff from him. It's like trying to be a dual citizen. If you are in his kingdom, it's his kingdom, he says. You can't be in two kingdoms, one foot in the world, other foot in, in the kingdom of God. God says, this ain't going to work. Thine is the kingdom. This is my kingdom. You want to do business with me? You come over in my kingdom and live my lifestyle. This is how you prepare to pray. Please get the CD. There's too much information. The power. Everybody say the power. That means the ability for him to bring the petition to pass is with him. Praise the Lord. When you make a request, he says, I got the power to bring it to pass. The glory means I will produce it in a culture. I will give you not just a something. I'll give you the whole lifestyle. The glory belongs to me. I'll give you the imprint. You begin to look like me. Walk like mine. They'll know that you got your petition. And let me say this last word. Amen. Be careful how you use the word amen. Ignorance is amazing. I can always tell when a person is ignorant by the way they use amen. You shouldn't say amen to a lot of things. One time I heard a preacher preaching. And the devil is an evil devil. And the devil will destroy you. Amen. Don't say amen to that. Amen means so let it be. Let him destroy me. See, you can't say amen to everything. <laughs> and I know that you are a sinner. Amen. No. Don't say amen to that. If you're born again, full of the Holy Ghost and you've been forgiven. But we are so ignorant. We just say amen to anything. Amen is a Hebrew concept. It actually means let it happen just like you said. It means I agree with God. Amen simply means I submit to the purpose of God. It means that I surrender. Amen means we agree and submit to God's desire to fulfill his own will. That's why the Bible says that the angels in heaven say, Amen. They say, Amen. God, let your will come to earth. Amen. But I don't feel too well. Amen. Don't say that. Everybody clear? Yeah. The reason why we end with Amen is because we leave the courtroom knowing we got what we came for. It's done. That's what it means. Case closed. I can leave now and expect it because. Let it be just like you promised me. Remember Mary, when the angel came? Mary said, Amen, you know. But we translate it as, Be it unto me as you have spoken. The word Amen is there. <laughs> angel said, You should have a child. She said, Be it unto me like you have said it. She was saying, Amen. So we close the case by sealing it. I got it. So you walk out the courtroom and tell everybody, Everything I ask for, I'm going to get. My friends, I end the petition prototype, the template, so you can understand how to plead. What is petition? A legal document giving you evidence. Read this verse with me that you never saw before, Isaiah 43, verse 25. Read. I, even I, I'm um, he that blots out your transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. Now notice why God says he forgives you. For whose sake? He said, look, I want to answer your prayers. But the next verse is mind-blowing. Next verse. So that you can put me in remembrance, let us plead together. Declare thou that thou may be justified. These are legal terms. Look at that sentence. These are big words for some of you. The first statement is what? Put me in remembrance. Write down your notes. Remind me of what I said. That's all he's saying. Petitioning a government does not require inventing 
requests. It simply requires finding the request that was already written. So God said, when you come before me and all your sins are all in order, everything is forgiven and you're clean and everything is straight, he says, now, don't invent anything to say. Just bring me what I said and remind me that I said it. Petitioning. What's the next word? Plead. It is a legal word in Hebrew. Plead means what? Plead your case. Matter of fact, if you check, go home and check some of your Bibles, you'll see the actual words there. Plead your case. It's in the Bible. Plead your case means you bring your case before the court. How do you plead your case? First, you got to be a citizen, qualified. Then you got to know your constitution and the laws, and you got to know your rights. That's how you plead a case. Prayer is pleading a case. What's the last word? You will be what? Justified. Justified means to have what is rightfully yours. So God forgives you for his sake because he don't want you to walk out of the court and not get what you wanted. God is not happy when you tarry all night prayer meeting and he can't answer the prayer because you didn't pray right. Putting in time doesn't make God answer prayer. Jesus said it one time to the Pharisees and scribes. He says, he says you think you will be heard because of your much speaking. No matter how long you pray, God says, it doesn't matter. You can stand before the court outside and talk all you want. And the judge says, lock that nuisance up. It's a nuisance. But when you come in there with the procedure right, the judge then has to respond. And he responds based on what? The Constitution and the law. So that's, I hope, is what we mean by pleading the case. It means legal representation, legal advocate, legal defender, legal protector, legal rights, legal voice, legal researcher. I like that one. The Holy Ghost already researched your case. That's what lawyers do. They research your case. So when they come before the judge, they could actually pull out uh, what they call precedents. I'm going to slap the devil right now. Where the devil is? I just felt the Holy Ghost go down my back, man. I'm going to hit the devil. Everybody say researcher. 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 That's what lawyers do. You pay them to do research. What do they research? Cases. What cases? Like yours. Okay? So when you come before God, you can say like this in the Bible. You can say, Lord, you said that you are my shepherd and I shall not want. That's a promise. Okay. So I claim in that right now in the character of Jesus, I command that to be done on earth. I shall not want. And then you say, because your other servant said one time, he have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed beg bread. You're pulling up another case. And then say, Lord, Abraham didn't have a ram, but you found a ram in the ticket. He said, I'm pulling out cases. God said, I got to give it to you. You know your stuff. That's pleading your case. That's how you pray. But Lord, you did it for Daniel. You can do it for me. You already proved that you can do it. I got a case to prove it. God says, remind me. Remind me. Every case in this room is in that book. Every case. You can't have children. You're married. You're barren. God, God got the case. You need to go home and pull the case out. Sarah, barren. For 75 years, no children. So pull out the case. And I mean, don't joke with it. You know, this is, see, if you fool around, you won't get nothing. You understand what you're doing now. Go pray it again now that you understand it. Lord, according to Deuteronomy 28, you know, I prayed for a couple this morning. Who wanted to have children? They wonder why I quoted Deuteronomy 28. You know, they, they, they think I'm just kidding. I was grabbing a case. Deuteronomy 28 says, The womb of the righteous, this is a promise now, shall be fruitful. So I pulled the case. I was putting pressure on God. What's your case? 
There's a case for every situation. That's why you got to read the Bible. Because you can't pull a case you don't know about. Are you with me? You meet somebody who's a prostitute? Don't curse them. Don't get mad at them. There was a prostitute in the Bible. You pull the case out and you tell the prostitute, you know something? You can actually become the source of the Messiah. What are you talking about? Well, there's a case in the Bible of a prostitute named Rahab. And when the thieves, when the, when the, the secret agents came from Moses to check the town out, they lived with a prostitute. And they told her that if you hide us, we're going to ask God to bless you. And if that woman was the source of the lineage of Jesus Christ, if you study her lineage, she produced Jesus. So you got a case that every prostitute could be saved and used by God. You got a case. Hmm. Drug addict? They in the Bible. Noah was a drug addict. <laughs> Drink liquor like crazy. Clothes and everything, naked. God still used that man to start a new generation. God can save alcoholics. But you got a case. You bring the case. And you say, Lord, you've done it in this case. You do it again. Am I right, lawyers? You deal with cases. God says, remind me. Do your research. And come talk to me. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.